And yes, we're live. Hello, everybody. Sorry about being one minute late. It's most unlike me, <laughs> being a meticulous timekeeper. This is a lesson stream live. If you're watching the recording and you want to find out about the next one, the best thing to do is go to lessonstream.com and um, just sign up for the newsletter. That's it right there, you see. Um, no, it's not. That's it right there, you see. Just download a free lesson plan. You'll get the newsletter and I'll keep you informed about the next uh, event. So how are you all? If you could say hello in the chat, just like Kevin has done. Hello, Kevin. Um, a, a, a model student. Uh, this is the lesson stream live where we explore possibilities for using story and storytelling in the classroom. So if you're a teacher, this is this is for you. And um, you know this is a special day, don't you? A very special, well, tomorrow's the special day. This is the eve of a special day. And uh, this is we're, what we're going to do for the next 40 minutes is to, to revisit a story that um, I'm sure some of you know, some of you don't. Um, don't, don't, don't give it away if, if you do know it, because um, it's very easy to do so. But it's a story I love. And it's a story that as a teacher, I've used many times in the classroom before. It's a story um, that I've used many times as a teacher trainer. I've told it at many conferences. I've told it in seminars and workshops. Um, it's a story that um, I turned into a lesson plan for the first time about 12 years ago. And I shared it in the old lesson stream website. I wonder if any of you remember that. And it's a story that also made it into this book, Video Telling. YouTube stories for the classroom. It's not quite true to call this story a YouTube story. It's a story from television broadcasting history, but television broadcasting history stories for the classroom didn't sound so good, did it? And the important thing about this, this story is that it turns exactly 65 years old tomorrow. So thank you all so much for saying hello. We've got hello from Kevin, hello from Jan, hello Jan, hello Antonella, hello from Deborah, Griselda, hello there everybody. Nice to see you here. And um, I, I wonder if, um, don't, don't ruin it. I just want you to say either yes or no. Yes, meaning yes, I am familiar with this story, or no, I don't know this story, and I don't know what's coming. Um, but don't spoil the surprise, because if you do know the story, you'll know it's easy to ruin the surprise, right? Hello, Joanna from Poland, and Annabella still uses it. Um, and hello, um, Nargiza from Uz Uzbekistan. It's been a while. And Antonella it's a great story. She knows it. Andy. Hello, Andy. Nice to see you. It's been a while. And uh, George uh, or Jorge and Elena. Hello, Elena. Annabella. Franz. And uh, <laughs> so Antonella knows it. How about everybody else? Do you know this story? or do? Because it's such a good story, isn't it? It's such a great story. It's been one of my favorites. I would say it's one of my top top 12 stories for the classroom, I think. And I'm really happy that some people like Jan hasn't got a clue. And Judy tastes similar. Kevin thinks he might know it. Um, is that Sophie perhaps doesn't know what's coming? Oh, this is great. Most of you don't. Because I, I was expecting probably that most of you would know this story. So the fact that you don't is just, is just great. So, well, how do we begin? How do we start this story? Um, well, what I'm going to do is I want to invite you to come with me in, in, a, in a time travel. Uh, how, does, how does one time travel these days? I believe we need a time machine, right? Um, or we just need our imaginations, I suppose. So what I want you to do is um, let's beam ourselves back to 1957. 1957. I'm going to guess that none of you were were had been born before 1957. Am I right? Is there anybody here who was around in 1957? <laughs> um, 1957 is actually a very interesting year, okay? And we can go into that later. But 
Um, well, a few things about 1957 is that the war had ended just 12 years before that, but um, rationing in the United Kingdom had been had come to an end just three years before that. So rationing in the United Kingdom, food rationing that is, had come to an end in 1954. And so the years following food rationing were very notable. They were times when the kind of bad moods of people being hungry were coming to an end, you know, and uh, things were looking a bit better. Oh, so look, look, we've got... <laughs> Jan, I saw your picture before, but I didn't think, I, I didn't, I really didn't think. And Kevin was born in 1957. And so was Juicy. Is that how, is that how you pronounce your name? Juicy. Um, so this is very interesting. Um, feel free to, to send me some photographs that you may have from the 70s. Um, so Okay, let's go back to 1957. All right, we're all back in 1957. And it's a, it's a Monday evening in April. And you're at home with your family somewhere in the United Kingdom. Now, where would you like to be in the United Kingdom? You can be anywhere you, anywhere you like in the United Kingdom. Type in your answer. So it's 1957. It's a Monday evening in April. Um, you're at home with your family somewhere in the United Kingdom. Where would you like to be? Where about in the United Kingdom specifically? Perhaps you'll choose a city. Perhaps you'll choose a village somewhere in the countryside. Maybe some people would like to be in London. Um, I knew it. Yes, Eva has chosen London. Any particular place in London, Eva, or just anywhere in London? You want me to choose a random place? Deborah's gone for York. Interesting. Liverpool. France has chosen Billericay, which I know from a song by Ian Jury and the Blockheads. Do you know that song, France? I'm Little Ricky from Billericay. I wonder if you know it. So there we are, 1957, 65 years ago. It's Monday evening in April. You're at home with your family, somewhere in the United Kingdom. It might be, oh, Oban, Kevin's chosen. Oban, which is in the Isle of Mull. Um, Swansea, Bath, Orkney, Liverpool, York, London. And yeah, Orkney is an interesting place. Um, I've never been, I've always wanted to go. Um, so, so. Where about are you exactly? You're in this place, but sorry, where about in your house are you? Because you're at home. I didn't mention that. You're in the dining room, you see. Back in those days, nobody had TV dinners. <laughs> Eating was was very separate. It was a thing you would specifically did in the dining room. And uh, if anyone, I don't want to draw attention to 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 anybody here in particular but if you can if you have memories of this no i've got jan please don't forgive me for asking how old were you jan in 1957 i'm going to guess you were one or two years old so i'm going to guess that your memories of that year um were very very hazy or if indeed you have any at all so you're at so you're we're in the dining room and you're having dinner okay the question is what are you having for your dinner what are you having for dinner so Jan was two years old. So you, you that's, that's incredible. So yes, you probably don't really remember um, much about 1957, Jan. Um, hello, Margaret's just made it in. Um, so, so 1957, you're at home. Um, it's a Monday evening, April, somewhere in the United Kingdom. You're with your family. You're in the dining room. But what are you having for dinner. Don't forget, there's no pizza, there's no sushi, there's no ready-made -mail meals. Mince and tatties, says Jan. Great example of a dinner from the 1950s. Maybe another idea, maybe other possibilities could have been um, liver and onions. Liver and onions. Mm. Um, how about um, boiled potatoes? Kevin says, uh, mince and dumplings. Beans on toast. Yeah, I guess that's a pretty good one. Tinned sardines, cauliflower, bacon and eggs, jacket potatoes is great. Nobody's choosing sushi. Bread and scrape. 
That's right, large, or sometimes they called it dripping, didn't they, Andy? Um, spam or corned beef, two fantastic um, tins of meat, um, bread and butter. Or what, what about Marga roast artichokes? I would be surprised if you could have found them in the 50s in the United Kingdom, but you being from um, Mallorca, per perhaps that's what, what you had. Chicken broth, onion soup. Um, the other big one could have been fish fingers because fish fingers kind of revolutionized dinner time for mother. And I'm not being sexist here. This was the way it was. Um, <laughs> beef and pudding, boiled nettles. Um, because fish fingers was one of the very first um, processed foods, which really reduced the preparation time and the kitchen time for poor mother, who used to spend far too much time in the, in the kitchen and was expected to have meals ready for the kids and for father, kids, uh, the mother would often eat with the kids and father would often eat um, later on on his own. Um, I've been doing my research. <laughs> Fish and chips, yeah, why not? So anyway, tonight, tonight you are really, really excited. This is a very special night for you. You're really excited. I wonder if you know why um, why you're so excited. Why are you so excited tonight on this Monday evening in April in 1957 in the United Kingdom, in London, in the Orkney Islands, in Billericay, doesn't matter where, but tonight you're having your dinner and you, you are so excited. I mean, you are beside yourself which is a way of saying you're very excited. You're beside yourself. Why? Why is tonight such a special night? What's it all about? What's going on here? I'm watching. There's a time delay we have, a 10-second time delay between me speaking and answering. First ever TV program. That's, that's really interesting, Andy. Um, and uh, I would love for you to... As a, as a homework task um, to find out when the first ever T British broadcast TV program was. Um, but it was considerably earlier than 1957. I've got a feeling it was maybe the very late 40s or the very early 50s, around about 1950. And I used to know, but I can't be sure. And it, nor was it the first ever kids TV show because kids children's TV had been going for a while. Um, and, but these are great. These are good guesses. Um, hello from Argentina. Um, first ever kids show, Andy said, first ever TV program, because you're going to meet your granny for the very first time. <laughs> Is that <laughs> what a good idea? Going back in time to meet your granny, Eva. Um, I'm going to tell you why. It's definitely got something to do with TV. Uh, that's right. Andy Pandy classic was first shown in 1952. I wonder if you know what the, um, not forgotten, sorry about that. Um, okay, let me tell you why you're so excited. Marga, Marga's got the answer because today you have just had a special delivery. Today you've had a special delivery and you know what it is? It's a brand new television set, a brand new television set. It's just been set up in the sitting room or it's just been set up in the living room. I don't know if you prefer living room or sitting room, but it certainly hasn't been set up in the dining room because that's not how things worked in those days. So you eat your dinner tonight faster than you've ever eaten it before because you want to get through there to the sitting room or to the living room. And so you finish your dinner, you get through to the sitting room and the television is there waiting for you in the corner. Now it's time to turn it on. Um, who has the remote control? Who's got the remote control here? That's what you ask your students anyway, if you carry out this activity with them in the classroom, which you could do tomorrow. This is a perfect activi activity for, for tomorrow. And of course, let's see if anybody was, fell for that trick question because it was a trick question. 1957, there were no remote controls. So obviously, father. Father's the boss here. That's the way it probably was. Father 
stands up um, to go and turn on the TV. Now, I wonder if you know how many channels there were in the United Kingdom um, on television in 1957. Um, this is interesting. Oh, is it Sophie? Have I got that right? Um, 1932, first ever British experimental TV program. So, okay, that's interesting. I wonder, yes, that's right. There was experimentation, but then there was public broadcasting, wasn't there as well? Um, so there was there were actually two channels. There were two, um, not one, but two, not three, but two. And some people would think it was BBC One and BBC Two, but it wasn't. There was no, there was no BBC One or BBC Two. There was just the BBC. That's what it was. That's what it was called, the BBC. And um, the second channel was ITV, which is independent television. Um, and those were the two channels. Um. So you turn on the television, it's about half past eight, okay? It's about around about half past eight or somewhere after. And father turns on the television, and the first thing you see on your brand new television is a current affairs program. And so what you've got here is some news. It's some news. The first thing you see on your brand new television at home in 1957 is some news. And on this news program, they're broadcasting a special report from Switzerland. I wonder if there's anybody here taking part today from Switzerland. You see, they're reporting from Switzerland and they're reporting a story about a certain crop and the harvesting of it. So it's a story about the harvesting of a certain crop. Now, you see, according to this story, according to this news report, Europe that year, 1957, has had a very mild winter. And in Switzerland, this has resulted in a very successful harvest of this crop, you see. And so basically that's the programme. A current affairs program, you see a news report about a certain crop from Switzerland. Now, you listen to the narrator. I mean, let's face it, this is probably not the most exciting TV program that's in the history of TV broadcasting, but you've never seen television before in your own home. So this is massive for you. You take what you're given. Let me tell you some of the facts about this crop because your task or your student's task is to identify this crop given five statements about it. I'm gonna go through these very quickly. So the narrator tells us, number one, that the crop usually comes from Italy. That's statement number one. The, the crop usually comes from Italy. Number two, it grows on trees. Number three, after being hand-picked, it's left to dry in the warm alpine sun. That's number three. Number four, it's long and thin. Number five, you have to boil it and drain it before eating. Now, don't worry yet. Don't, don't type in your answers yet. But the idea here is that you can dictate those five sentences to your students and ask them to think carefully about what this mystery crop could be. I would suggest maybe dictating one sentence at a time, then getting them to work in pairs or small groups to make a list of as many things it could be as possible. So the crop usually comes from Italy. Tomatoes, perhaps. It grows on trees. Oh, it's still tomatoes, I guess, yeah. Um, apples, maybe. Um, after being hand-picked, it's left to dry in the warm alpine sun. A bit more difficult. It's long and thin. Hmm, you have to boil it and drain it before eating. So students have to guess what the mystery crop is. Okay, let's have a little pause here. Let's have a little pause here. What we've just done is, well, it's an interactive teacher-led storytelling. And I think you can imagine, can't you, that if you were to, to use this in the classroom, and by the way, um, this is the most recent lesson plan in, in lesson stream. That's the notes I've just 
used. Um, if you were to do this, you can see all the possibilities for questions to students, teacher to students questions. You can see the potential for interaction, the potential for the discussion. Um, and there's also opportunity for students to ask you teachers, sorry, to ask you the teacher questions of their own, something I would always encourage. Moments we say, okay, any questions, questions about the story itself, questions about the language that you've used, and you probably imagine how many new words or phrases or language could come out of this to be written on the board. So to me, this is one of the this is the value of teacher-led storytelling like this, when it's interactive, allowing to you to immerse your students in meaningful exchanges of language. Um, by the way, a little question for you about televisions. Um, do you know? I mean, how much a television would have cost in 1957? It actually would have cost a lot of money. It would have been somewhere, if we were to convert it to, to today's currency, it would have been something in the, the realms of, of thousands of pounds, maybe up to 5,000 or six or seven or even 8,000 pounds, um, probably about the same in euros. Um, and, you know, families could not afford that. Yet by 1957, more and more households were actually um, getting television sets. And there's a really good, there's a really good episode. I wonder if you've seen it in season two of The Crown. Do you, any fans of The Crown here? You can be a fan of The Crown without being a, 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 a fan of the monarchy. <laughs> I'm a the British monarchy. I I, I quite like the crown, um, and I, I really enjoyed season two. And there's a there's one of the you know you know it's like it's a the dramatization of the story of Queen Elizabeth the uh, second. And uh, in season two, there's this one scene when the queen is at home with her mother, the queen mother, and they're watching TV. It's actually 1961 because they're watching on the television the arrival of um, JFK, um, who's just come to, to Europe. He's been in France. He's coming to the United Kingdom yet. And they're talking about this, this hotshot president you see that the Queen is going to meet. But there's a problem because the television goes on the blink which is a kind of idiomatic way of saying it stops working. And so the Queen Mother stands up to start giving it a thump, bang, bang, to try and make it start working again. The Queen says, no, stop it. Don't forget, that's a rented television, which is a really interesting little sort of cultural detail, a reminder that back in those days, um, you know, even uh, the royal family would have... <laughs> would have rented their television, which I always thought was a very interesting little cultural uh, detail. Now, what we've done so far, this story that we've mentioned is the one that comes from this book, because I've used this story many times before, and there are two versions of it that I've used. Um, that was the first version. And this, the second version of it is... What we're going to how we're going to move from here okay so what we're going to do for the second part of the activity um it could be regarded as a different way of doing this activity or it could be done as part two of the same activity but what we're going to do is we're going to look at a video transcript all right this is a thank you very much marga can't resist but posting your comment on the screen there <laughs> so um what we're going to do is we're going to look at a, 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 a transcript of the, the narrator's words. So let me just contextualize this for you again. All right. So 1957, um, you know, you sit down at home with your family. You turn on the television. It's half past eight in the evening. And there's this current affairs program. And they have this report coming from Switzerland about a certain crop. And what I have here for you is the exact transcript that came from the narrator on that night, okay? And I'm gonna show you it. Now, you, there's an obvious task here, and that is for students to um, guess what the missing word is. 
Um, in the lesson plan that I've got for you, there's a bit more to it than that. There's a lot of activities about the language, find a word which means, etc. And there's some comprehension questions as well. But we'll take that part as read. So let's take the first part of the text. The narrator tells us in this report that the last two weeks in March are an anxious time for the something farmer, the crop farmer. This is the mystery crop. Uh, there's always the chance of a late frost, which, while not completely ruining the crop, generally affects the flavour and makes it difficult for him, 1957 before, we can uh, excuse him for the, excuse the sexism perhaps, to obtain top prices in world markets. But these dangers are over and the harvest goes forward. Now, something that's very important that you have to know is the missing word is the same word in every case. It's a noun, and it's the same noun in the same form. But is it singular? Is it plural? Is it countable? Or is it uncountable? Now, if you know the story, then please do not type in your answer. But if you don't know the story, please type in the answers that you think it could be. What do you think the missing word could be? It's the same word as I said. It's a noun. It's some kind of crop. Um, and it's the same word that fits in these two gaps and will fit in all the gaps that you're going to see in the next three slides. And um, what could this missing word word B. The last two weeks in March are an anxious time for the, 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 the something farmer. There's always the chance of a late frost, which while not completely ruining the crop, generally affects the flavour and makes it difficult for him or her, I will add, to get top prices in world markets. But now these dangers are over and the harvest goes forward. I've included a little frost icon there because it's a it's a key word in that text. You'll have to explain that frost is not snow. It's just that glazing, that frozen layer that forms over grass or leaves when the temperatures go below zero. I googled some images of frost today. Um, don't know why. Had some time to kill had a look at the images and got very nostalgic. I haven't seen frost for years living in Barcelona. This is my Barcelona flat. And live, being from Scotland, used to get a lot of frost, good amount of frost. Um, yeah, mainly in the winter time. Um, and I saw some beautiful pictures today and it, it almost brought a tear to my, my eye. Um, yes, nobody's decided to um, guess what the mystery crop could be. I guess that's just because you don't know. Maybe no one's got any ideas whatsoever, which surprises me, which surprises me. I could keep going. I could continue to talk nonsense, try to bide my time, give you extra time to, to find some answers. But uh, thank you, Alan. Alan, it's nice to see you, Alan. Alan says sugar beet, sugar beet. Great, great crop, Alan. Um, Deborah says pine cones. Pine cones. Is pine cones a crop? If it is, this is new to me. Um, I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying it's new to me, pine cones. I know that some animals eat pine cones. So maybe if we're talking about um, animal farmers, then maybe... Um, yeah, maybe you do. Maybe you do harvest pine cones. If you do, then please tell me. Eva says orange. Now that's interesting, Eva, because Alan's taken a word which is um, sugar beet. Now you've you've. Would you agree that the word that fits the gap has to be singular or plural? Because we're looking at collocations here. We're looking at the something farmer and the something harbor. So it could be the sugar beet farmer, the sugar beet harvest. It could be the orange farmer. It could be the orange harvest. It could be the corn farmer or the corn harvest. It could be the maize farmer or the maize harvest. Mar Marga said beetroot, which is similar to sugar beet, isn't it? Um, but it couldn't be 
pine cones, could it? Because um, you couldn't have the pine cones farmer or the pine cones harvest. Similarly, you couldn't have the plums farmer or the plums harvest, but you could have the plum farmer or the plum harvest. So we're looking here for a word which is singular, aren't we? Um, let's keep going. The missing word cultivation here in Switzerland is not, of course, carried out on anything like the enormous size of the Italian industry. Many of you, I'm sure, will have seen pictures of the large missing word plantations in the Po Valley in Italy. For the Swiss, however, it tends to be more of a family affair. So again, this is Again, we're real. We're, we're you know this is we've seen. The, do you remember those five sentences be from before? Now we're seeing a more sort of elaborated, um, uh, an elaboration of those five sentences. So, pine nuts come from pine trees, says Miss S. Wright, whose name I still don't know. If she's told me, I apologise because I didn't see you doing so. Um, Pine nuts come from pine trees. Of course. What a silly, silly sausage I am. Um, and no, it's not sausage or sausages. Um, olives. So again, it could be olives. The crop could be olives, but the missing, the specific missing word here would have to be olive. Olive cultivation, olive plantations, olive farmer, olive harvest. harvest. And what I'm what I'm doing here is the feedback. So as a teacher, you're asking students just to make a list of all the crops. They can be free. They can write oranges, plums, pine nut, maize, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to this, you've got to be very, very picky or exigente in Spanish or tiquis miquis in Spanish <laughs> about the grammar of this because it can't be olives. It has to be olive because we're looking for a singular noun. And Marga, again, the crop could be figs, but the missing word has to be fig. Great, Marga. Good student. You self-corrected. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> cherry. Cherry. Why not? Coffee, says Alain. Hello, Alain. Um, pumpkin, perhaps. So this is fantastic. This is an opportunity. Now, this is one of this text that I'm giving you for me has to be, if I said this is one of my favorite stories, this is one of my all time favorite texts. One of my all time favorite texts for the language classroom. The, just let me show you here that the, 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 um, the worksheet I have, I've prepared for you here for the lesson plan is, um, you know, it's it's got the entire text. That wasn't it, actually. Um, it's got the whole text in the box in the middle. So you can give students the whole text at once. I've got all these questions for them at the bottom, you see. But I would myself personally prefer to make use of the slides which is what you see now, which is going, we're going to lend themselves to eyes or rather heads up reading. So if the teacher can show this text one paragraph at a time, there are four paragraphs and ask the questions that I am asking you and conduct the activity, which is what I'm doing right now to get students to write down all the crops it could be and then go back over the specific grammar and say, well, what are we looking for? Is it a singular noun or a plural noun? Establish that when we're looking at collocation in this way, it has to be a singular because we talk about potato farmers and not potatoes farmers. This is a little detail of English grammar, and it's really good for this. We've got a few more coming in here. We've got apples. We've got rice. We've got grapes. We've got tangerines. Hello, Nelly. And we've got ginger. Hello, Anna Maria. And hello, Mighty. So let's continue um, another reason why this may be such a successful year is because of the disappearance of the something weevil, the tiny creature that has destroyed many harvests in the past. Um, that's a weevil. It's actually, I've put it there in case you're brushing your computer screen thinking that some dirty insect has just landed on your screen. 
Don't worry, it's not. I put it there. Similarly, the handout contains an evil weevil on the side, just to reinforce what these uh, <laughs> creatures are all about. Um, so again, I could, you know, this could reinfer this could possibly reinforce what's gone before, um, or maybe allow you to eliminate some things. Although, you know, I don't think anyone here is an expert in pests, crop pests, are you? Or are you? <coughs> Gillian, hello, Gillian, says tea. Yes, please, Gillian, milk and two sugars. <laughs> sorry, bad joke. Um, okay, now, those three sentences, sorry, I should say paragraphs, have a lot in common because the missing word is all about these collocations. We've got the something farmer, the something harvest, something cultivation, something plantations, the something weevil, and by implication, something pickers, and something trees. And so really, these are the seven different um, collocations that we could be looking at. And as has been established before, we're really looking for a singular noun to fill the gap. So, you know, the last two weeks in March are an anxious time for the potato farmer. It could be, but not the potatoes farmer. Now, the final paragraph is a key one because it doesn't really make any reference to these collocations. It talks much more about the grammar of the noun. So after picking, the crop, whatever it is, is laid out to dry in the warm alpine sun. Many people are puzzled by the fact that it's produced at such uniform length, but this is the result of years of patience and efforts by plant breeders who have succeeded in producing the perfect mm. Very interesting, don't you think? Now, what makes this different is the grammar that follows the word. Again, we're looking for a noun. We've established that it has been its same form throughout this text. Okay, we've established already that it has to be singular, but the question here is, is it countable or uncountable? Is it singular countable or is it singular uncountable? So could it be... Uh, I'm just going to give you a moment to think about, is it this? Is it singular countable or is it singular uncountable? And the answer is right there in front of you because it all comes down to this word, is. Um, because, you know, if it was singular countable, sorry, if it was singular uncountable, like asparagus, you'd have to say that many people are often puzzled by the fact that asparagus is produced at such uniform length. If it was singular countable, like carrots, then it'd be carrots are produced at such uniform length. So students then have to go through this big list that they've just made, count, score off all the, the words which are singular countable, because what we're looking for is a singular uncountable word like coffee, like rice, like asparagus, like wheat, like cotton. It can't be tomatoes. It can't be apples. It can't be potatoes. And I'm sorry if you thought it might be potatoes. I knew there was a few people hoping it would. It could, yes, it could be squash. It could be squash. Grammatically, it could. But then if you go back to the content, of course, does squash grow in trees? So we have these as a pro potential, you know, as a problem. All right. Now, it's time to show you the video. And what I'm going to do here, I'm actually, rather than actually show you the video on my screen, because of copyright, I'm going to drop the video into the chat, all right? Um, I'm going to drop the video into the chat. Now, if you, you can't see this chat, if you're watching live, what you have to do, just, just by the way, just by the way, no, actually, I've changed my mind. I'm going to show you the video. I'm going to show you the video. I think we're safe here um, because um, I know what happens. Um, I get a copyright strike. No, I get a copyright notice. The BBC will claim this video as their own. I've tried it already and it's all safe, all right? So what I'm gonna do is show you this video. This is the video that you see, 1957, a Monday night. 
that was broadcast the first time 65 years ago tomorrow. This is Panorama, which is the longest running current affairs and news program in the history of television. It's still running today, so it's breaking our new record every minute that it's not taken off air. So this is what the this is the report right now. Are you ready? It isn't only in Britain that spring this year has taken everyone by surprise. Here in the Ticino, on the borders of Switzerland and Italy, the slopes overlooking Lake Lugano have already burst into flower, at least a fortnight earlier than usual. But what, you may ask, has the early and welcome arrival of bees and blossom to do with food? Well, it's simply that the past winter, one of the mildest in living memory, has had its effect in other ways as well. Most important of all, it's resulted in an exceptionally heavy spaghetti crop. The last two weeks of March are an anxious time for the spaghetti farmer. There's always the chance of a late frost, which, while not entirely ruining the crop, generally impairs the flavour and makes it difficult for him to obtain top prices in world markets. But now these dangers are over and the spaghetti harvest goes forward. <laughs> spaghetti cultivation here in Switzerland is not, of course, carried out on anything like the tremendous scale of the Italian industry. Many of you, I'm sure, will have seen pictures of the vast spaghetti plantations in the Po Valley. For the Swiss, however, it tends to be more of a family affair. Another reason why this may be a bumper year lies in the virtual disappearance of the spaghetti weevil, the tiny creature whose depredations have caused much concern in the past. After picking, the spaghetti is laid out to dry in the warm alpine sun. Many people are often puzzled by the fact that spaghetti is produced at such uniform length. But this is the result of many years of patient endeavor by plant breeders who've succeeded in producing the perfect spaghetti. And now the harvest is marked by a traditional meal. Toasts to the new crop are drunk in these pocalinos. And then the waiters enter bearing the ceremonial dish. And it is, of course, spaghetti. Picked earlier in the day, dried in the sun, and so brought fresh from garden to table at the very peak of condition. For those who love this dish, there's nothing like real homegrown spaghetti. <laughs> I was just looking at your comments there. Maria, Maria, she says, like I said, is that the case, Maria? I think somebody did say spaghetti. Somebody did say spaghetti. Uh, was it you, Maria? Was it? <laughs> and so a few of you, the penny has dropped. Maria Sarah said, the 1st of April, duh. April Fool's Day, exactly. This, this is regarded as being the very first time that the medium of television was used for an April Fool's hoax. And it has gone down in TV hope folklore. It's a very famous story. It's very well documented. And as I said, this is one of my favorite stories for the classroom. What strikes me is that it's, it's despite it's the fact that it's so famous, so many people, this makes no sense. Maybe, maybe outside the UK, I should say then. So many outside the UK, it seems that so many people, very few people seem to know it. I actually presented this at a, a conference in Bologna a few years ago before the days of COVID. And I was amazed that, that hardly anybody knew about it, which makes the story all that much more valuable for the classroom. So often, however, somebody will say, well, what happens if somebody knows the answer and ruins it? Now, that is always a potential problem. And I'd like to just I'd like to just show you a little clip of that conference I mentioned. So you're going to see a little clip of me presenting this, um, telling this story to a group of, of Italian teachers. And I want you to note how I deal with with somebody shouting out the answer. And what I want you to take away from this is the most important answer to that question. What do you do if somebody guesses the answer is the answer is don't panic. Okay. So just, just watch this and uh, here's what happens. Here I am. 
Are you ready for this? Oh, just little warning. Just turn your sound down just a little bit in case this is loud. I'm not sure if this is going to be a little bit louder than the current levels. So I don't want you to get a, a bad surprise if you're wearing headphones. Okay, so just turn your sound down just a little bit. Okay. Now, father turns on, father turns on the television. He puts it onto the BBC, and there is a news program, a current affairs program. And tonight, there's a report from Switzerland. Your neighbours. <laughs> Sorry, that was in the genos. <laughs> About a spaghetti tree. Are you mad? No. They don't exist. <laughs> so, now just put up your hands if you think you know what this crop is, but don't say anything. Put up your hands if, you, if you're not sure, but you think maybe you could guess. What do you think this crop could be? What is it in Italian? Caruba. What's caruba? It's a sort of banana. Carob. Carob. What else could it be? Rice. Rice. So is rice long and thin? It, rice is long and thin before they cut it up. <laughs> Could it be asparagus? Could it be tomatoes? Spaghetti. But you're the second person that said spaghetti. <laughs> I know that. I know that Italians have a thing going with spaghetti. Anyway, this report finishes, yes? Maybe corn. Maybe corn. So you get the idea here. Now, the, the most important thing is if a student shouts out spaghetti, which is something that can happen any day, not just during this activity. Spaghetti! It might be lunchtime. But if a student shouts out spaghetti while you're using this activity, number one, don't panic. Number two, don't feel the need to kind of suppress that student. If you're bold, that student might know the answer or that student might think they know the answer. That doesn't mean everybody else is going to immediately think that student's right. Entertain the idea. Say, did you say spaghetti? That's a very interesting, that's a very interesting answer. Spaghetti. How funny. So spaghetti go in trees? Of course it doesn't. And meanwhile, if you can gesture to that student so that the student sees the gesture, but nobody else does, either maybe a friendly wink or a maybe approach the student, that's going to work from face to face, but it's going to be more difficult online teaching. But if you could, if, you know, if entertain it without asking the student why you think that, but try to entertain the idea and then put it to bed. That's how I would deal with this. And I've never, I've used this activity so many times. If I'm using it with a large audience, usually one or two or three people will shout out spaghetti, but it has never once ruined the activity. I've used it in the classroom as well. I've Generally, when I've used it in the classroom, nobody's known it because we've got the numbers game. When you're using it in a conference or a large group, there's a more likely somebody will know it. But using a classroom, a small group, it's less likely. So I've, I don't recall a time a student has actually known it was spaghetti. So it really has allowed me to take this activity the way I've used it with you right to the very end. I want to show you, I want to end by showing you something quite funny. <laughs> this is, this was uh, something a few years ago, I think this was three years ago, my mum posted some images on Facebook, which really made me laugh. You see, my, my, two, my two nephews, Tomas and Matteo, had been visiting my mum and dad, their grandparents, uh, in Scotland, it was April the 1st, and my mum had told them the story of the Barcelona spaghetti tree hoax. And so my two nephews decided that they wanted to recreate it for themselves. <laughs> so my mum 
cook some spaghetti for them. And here they are putting it onto the trees. That's Matteo, the youngest one, lissing a tree in the garden with spaghetti, taking it all very seriously. And here is their work. <laughs> Isn't that great? Do you like that? <laughs> um, also, um, I asked my parents if they could send me some photographs from the 50s, which I thought would be really nice. There's a few follow-ups here. One of the, the first follow-up is for students. They've got the basic of the story, but they don't know anything about the story behind the story. How was it conceived? Where did the idea come from? What were the practicalities of, of actually bringing it to life and producing it and broadcasting it? How did the public react to it? And any more details or information about this story that's interesting? This is your student's follow-up task. Maybe they could also do this as a follow-up task, create their own spaghetti cheese just for a bit of fun, but also maybe ask their parents um, if they've got any photographs um, or their grandparents from the 50s with interesting stories behind it. And my parents shared these ones. That's my that's my little mother on the on the right hand side, and my baby aunt, that's my mother Anne, and my aunt Jill on the left hand side, sitting down, little baby with a, a Mohican haircut, which I've I love this picture. And there's my 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 grandparents, my mother's parents, my mother again on the, the right, uh, between my grandfather's knees and my Aunt Jill, that's my grandfather Richard, and Jill my um, being held by my grandfather, my grandmother Alison. So very difficult and confusing. And uh, my dad gave me this one of his own parents. That's my papa, um, Jack on the left, and my my grandmother Mary on the right. I've, I, I always assumed they were in a boat, but I'm sure they're not in a boat. I don't know what they're, they're doing here. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's, uh, that's the activity. This is the most recent lesson plan in the lesson stream membership. It looks like this. I've printed it out today to help me to take you through this lesson stream live. Um, it's there to be downloaded. Um, if you're, uh, we've got some members present here. So the members who are present is waiting for you right now. You can download it to use it for tomorrow. Um, if you're not a member, um, it's very easy to join. You get access. As soon as you join the membership, you you get um, access to the community. We're called the Fishbowl. You also get access to the story course. And by the way, we've actually made reference to this story twice now in the story course. Um, you get access to the entire entire lesson stream library this lesson plan which is called 1957 i think is our 93rd pdf lesson plan um waiting for you um so that's one of them these are three more you see and you also get the fishbowl weekly which is our weekly roundup news net letter which has just been sent out today um so you get all these things, the story course, the lesson stream library, the community, and the social events which take place on Zoom, for for example, um, open mic storytelling events, all for nine, sorry, $8.99 per month or $89.90 per year. And it's very easy to join. All you do is go to lessonstream.com and you see that pink button at the top of the screen, it says join the membership. Click on that, and that's where you will be taken to the, the page. Now, are there any questions from anybody? Any questions at all? Just let me go through these. Um, that's Mary has said a little tip here. If you're teaching online, you can text the student privately. In fact, that's a really good idea, Mary. What I might do is type out, please do not ruin the surprise. Copy so that you could then very quickly paste that into a direct message, a private message for your student to save you the time of having to type it out. So that's a good, that's a very good, um, a very good uh, tip. You could also include the emoji of the finger to the tip the lips, couldn't you? Um, so yes, thank you, Mary. Margo said, said thank you for that. Um, um, Thank you. Just reading some. Thank you for your nice. Thank you. You've, you've had some. I wonder if anybody's having uh, 
what a, a great <laughs> are you cooking spaghetti yeah what a great grandmother <laughs> um Nelly says, Nelly's a thank you, Nelly. If any of if any of the members that are present here want to tell the non-members why to join, like Nelly has said, join the course and you'll get excellent lesson plans and resources. Thank you very much, Nelly. I really appreciate. Um and, and so Ms. S Wright says, ah, that's a plate of pasta inside this. You see, you know. As somebody who is a, a storyteller here, as, as I, I've been, as I do refer to myself as a professional storyteller. I, I, I know how much I can get away with. I know that I can put a plate of pasta inside a TV screen and show it to you all at the very beginning of the activity. And I know that now is a time when you go, ah, but I'm very aware that I can get away with this sort of thing. You will not ruin the surprise. Did, did anybody think, oh, I know where this is going because there's a plate of pasta. It, 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 you can get away with so much. Professional storytellers do this, you know? People who work in screenwriting, people who work in um, documentary making, uh, breaking bad is you can get away with giving so much away and the result is later on a delightful collect connection. You go, ah, but very rarely, if ever, will you ruin the surprise. So absolutely, I'm glad you said that. Um, Argentina, you're still in, we're, <laughs> we're still in March as well, Eva. Um, we're still in March until tomorrow. Anyone else? Made it into April yet? Anyone else? Actually in an April time zone. Um, thank you very much, Marga. Thank you, Gillian. All right, I think uh, there's a nice, very, very lovely thing. Membership gives you excellent teaching ideas like this one. Thank you, Antonella. And thank you so much, Franz. Now you know what to cook tonight, but you have to go into your garden to get it. Exactly. And have a nice spaghetti dinner. And Olga, that's a wonderful course. You've used Jamie's tips hundreds, hundreds of times. They work perfectly with children. They remember these lessons. They all use story, don't they? Of story and storytelling. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alain. I'm going to, going to join the gang of storytellers. And thank you, Maria. Thank you for the lovely advice. And thank you, Maria. And thank you to all of you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, and it's... Uh, it's a good lesson plan for tomorrow, and that's why we're doing this today, obviously. So um, if anybody needs any advice about, you know, about how to use this lesson plan once you've had a look at it, uh, just send me a line or ask a question. Ask a question in the fishbowl. All right, I'm going to let Olga here have, uh, thank you so much, and let's let Olga have the last, the last word. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks so much as always. Um, I'll keep you informed about the next lesson stream live. I'm trying to do one every other week. Um, as long as you are a subscriber to the lesson stream emails, that's a lesson stream post, which are free. I will make sure you get the notifications of these lesson stream lives. All right. Sign up at lessonstream.com. Uh, thank you very much. Another heart from Rasa. Hello, Rasa. Another one from Marga. Thank you so much. All right. Happy spaghetti and happy April Fool's Day tomorrow. Thanks again. Bye-bye now. Bye, everyone. Bye.